<laughs> so with that being said, why don't you introduce yourself, grab a cup of coffee, but this is kind of a laid back time, so just take your time, we'll be back in a few minutes. This series, it's gonna be, um, I think this is gonna be very, very helpful for all of us. And when I talk about the basics, there's two parts obviously to this, to the title, we, we chose it specifically. Um, when I, I do a lot of coaching in sports, and one of the things that we talk about all the time is this idea of the importance of constantly practicing and reviewing the fundamentals. And I don't think that changes in anything that we do in life. Whatever your expertise is, anything that you want to get better at, you've always got to come back to the basics. Okay? And in sports, it's, you know, it's how to feel the ground ball. It's how to, you know, when you're doing your, your swing and all the different things. It's just the fundamentals. And if you do that day in and day out, you're going to slowly but surely get better and better. And a lot of times in the, in the Christian faith, um, we get away from the basics sometimes. And even one of the basics we're not going to talk about in the series, but even just attending church, coming on a, on a regular basis and saying, you know what, that's, that's a Sabbath, that's a time of rest, that's a time for me to be encouraged, inspired, and motivated, and equipped to go out and live the Christian life. So this idea of a life worth living is vitally important. You're going to hear me say this a lot when we um, do the teaching because there's... I feel like, just like I said with that song, there's a lot of us that are just surviving. We're just getting by. And Jesus said, and John said that he came to give us life and life to the fullest. We have to break down what does that mean? Because I think a lot of us have heard that scripture before, but maybe we don't know what the essence of that means. So when we look at the fundamentals, I think that that's something that we will be able to um, better understand and then also be able to practice. And so, one of the things that um, I've always said, one of the things I enjoyed when I first became a Christian in 1992, um, I loved it because at that time I was playing professional baseball, and this idea is that there's an even playing field. So when you say yes to Christ, you can grow as much as you want to, or you can remain stagnant. All it is is a choice. And it's a choice to say, am I going to practice the fundamentals on a regular basis? Am I going to practice loving my neighbor? You know, am I going to practice doing all the things that we talked about? And that was exciting to me. Um, I'm a very competitive person, so like my goal when I first became a Christian was like, all right, how do I be the absolute best Christian? Like the best Christian ever. How, how does that bother? Mother Teresa who? You know, I was like, how, how do you be the best Christian ever? And, um, and I say, you know, her name. And what do you, when I say her name, though, what comes to your mind? Best Christian ever. <laughs> Best Christian ever. Why? Why? Compassion, service, love. She laid down her life for the other. She lived out the fundamentals of the faith. You know, and, and she's not like, if you ever read her story, she never put herself on a pedestal. Like she was like meant for this role. Like she knew it when she was a kid, like she was going to be this unbelievable person for God. It wasn't like that. She just took a call and she said, I'm going to be committed to that call. And day in and day out, I'm going to serve, and I'm going to love, and I'm going to lay down my life. And that's how she became great. Everyone knows her name and why she, uh, why she was here. So back to this idea of living life to the fullest. Um, one of the things I feel it's important is that we find that something that's bigger than ourselves. So in itself, Christianity was that for me, this idea of getting outside of myself and having something beyond that. There had to be something more to what was going on in my life. And even in that, it was pretty cool, though, because I was on, um, I was on the path to becoming a Major League Baseball player. And so on, on all the other things, on how America kind of checks off the boxes to success, I was on that path. And yet in the middle of that, I felt the void and said, there has to be more to this life than just this. You know, the materialism and the success and all those different things. In the midst of it, it was so fascinating to me to see, like, why that wasn't enough. And I truly believe that to this day, that materialism will never satisfy. We talked about that um, a couple weeks ago. So this idea of giving ourselves to something bigger, it's like, how can I make a difference with my life in this world for here and now? We get one chance at this thing called life. And each and every day is a gift from God. And God's saying, how are you going to live this life? Who are you going to impact? It could be in your family. It could be your, your coworkers. It could be wherever you go. But... Will you wake up with that passion to say, you know what, this isn't about me, it's about whoever you put in my path. And when you start to live a life with that recognition and that awareness of the Holy Spirit saying, here's a person. I kind of got into the practice where I was like, 
no matter who I'm with, if I know they're of, you know, if, if I know they're a Christian, then I try to encourage them in their faith. I'm going to try to inspire them, encourage them, you know, in every, any way I can. If they're not, then I'm going to try to plant seeds into their lives. I'm going to try to befriend them and get to know them and invest in them. And I want to be um, an example before that. I want to exemplify how Christ lived this life because I believe it's the, the best way to live this life. But no matter what, we're on purpose, right? It's not just going to happen. You have to be intentional with it. And that's how I believe we get to that thing of how do we live life to the fullest. So as a church, I think it's important that we stay involved and that we find ways to serve not only here on Sunday mornings, but also Monday through Saturday out in our community. And that has to do with how do we help have strong families? How do we make sure that all of us have strong marriages, those that are married? How do we impact our community? And, and then how do we impact the world? And two things just come to mind. I said this to you, but maybe you're new here. You haven't heard it yet. Um, but I keep referencing Matthewson uh, Street Church, which is a church for the homeless. And I was just walking through Providence. I met with a, another pastor who, who has a church, a sanctuary church in Providence. So we were walking through that. And I just kept thinking about it. It's like when I went there, there was 300 people that were homeless. And just by going there, um, it does something to the soul. It reminds me of that there's need. And it reminds me of that I can be a part of fulfilling that and making a difference, even if it's this much. And so as a church, uh, Mark and I, we're going to be trying to strategize how can we um, go and make a difference with that church. And then um, maybe, did anyone get the newsletter? Could you raise your hand if you got the newsletter? All right. So if you didn't get the newsletter, either you didn't check your email, I have the wrong email, or you didn't sign up for it. <laughs> so um, if you go on stonecoastcommunity.org, if you go on our website, right at the very bottom of it, you just click on, there's a form that says, like I think it says, stay connected to Stone Coast Life, and you can just, we just need your uh, name, email, phone number, something like that. All right, and it's that simple, but that's our way of staying connected with you throughout the week. And we're going to be going to Greenlock, which is um, a therapeutic riding center in Rehoboth on June 11th. So I'm just telling you that now just to put it in your calendar if you can. But to me, this is a, one of those small ways where we have to sacrifice a little bit of our time. You know, it's a Saturday afternoon in the middle of June. But here's um, at Greenlock, there's a few people that run that organization. And it's a phenomenal place to be. I call it like their ministry because they take kids with um, severe disabilities, I mean severe, severe cases, and they use the horses to, to give them therapy, basically. And it's so interesting when you're there during the day when they're doing this, the kids come in all agitated, you know, some you know, yelling and all that stuff, and, and just really unnerved, and then you watch them get on the horses, and you watch the people there that are volunteering their time, most of them, and they're walking the kid through the trails. And as they do that, you can see peace come into the child's body. It's a fascinating thing to watch. And you know what it is? You watch the parents, because I, I can't even imagine um, how hard and how difficult it must be to be a parent with a severely handicapped child. And day in and day out of caring for this child and having to do everything for that you know, boy or girl. And then for that hour where their child is happy and filled with joy and they're on the horse and the mom or the dad that's there can just have a cup of coffee and relax. And for us, to me as a church, I want to be able to support them in that. And, um, and I feel like this is just a real small way of doing that, but it's, it's so beneficial. Uh, this lady, Edith, that runs the program um, is a phenomenal person and she just, they, you know, just constant upkeep, right? So there'll be painting projects, there'll be, um, you know, we sometimes put in like fences and, and clear brush and just, just different little things. There's cleaning that needs to be done and it's for all ages. I love it because I, we had kids, you know, from four years old up, you know, and uh, to anyone and everyone. So on June 11th, I'd love you to participate with us in that. And like I said, you can sign up online through the website. All right. So. With that being said, this morning, we're going to talk about the Great Commission. And a lot of people, um, that's very, very familiar to us. But I want to maybe go at it maybe a little bit differently. Um, and so, do we have someone to read the scriptures? It's a very short and sweet verse here. <laughs> Went to Galilee, to the mountain where 
Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. May God add his blessing to the reading, hearing, and doing of his word today. Amen. You may be seated. As we talk about the Great Commission, I want you to think about the themes of the, the power of sending, and also in that going and in that sending, there's risk involved. A lot of us want to stay comfortable in, you know, in our comfort zones. We never want to step out of that. But I think being part of following Christ is this adventure that he's constantly asking us to go into the unknown. And if we can learn to be comfortable in the uncomfortable, I think you'll find the greatest place to live life to the fullest. And that's one of the practices. Um, so I think before we get into the, the actual Great Commission, we're only going to hit one little piece of it today. And Dawn's going to speak after I'm done about um, the going part. But I want to just set it up because I feel like we have to understand the, the overarching story uh, and also what he says about the kingdom in order to really get the essence of the Great Commission. And can you put up the thing of the Yankees? I, some of you I know, Red Sox awesome yesterday. You know, if you're a Red Sox fan, go Red Sox. If you're a Yankees fan, go Yankees. You know, I play for the Yankees, so I'm just using that as a symbol. I'm sorry to those of you who are offended right now. Um, yesterday, Big Poppy had one heck of a day, right? It was phenomenal, walk up double, awesome. <laughs> um, however, this was my experience, and I want to share you my story of the New York Yankees as an 18 year old kid. Uh, one of my friends gave me a postcard and it was a postcard of this stadium, but it was completely empty with a little 10 year old boy sitting in the, in the seat with a glove on. And I kept that postcard because it made me think of that childhood dream, right? And I was just taking that one step right when I signed that contract. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be playing for the New York Yankees. And um, that picture, like just seeing that symbol of the New York Yankees and, and then seeing that stadium, and there's a certain mystique that goes with it, right? And then you look at the history of the Yankees and go to the next, the next picture. Like some of the, some of the Luke Gehrig and Babe Ruth, and you just, like they talk about the, the ghost, right? They talk about all the different things that happened in that story. The New York Yankees was more than just a team on the field. It was this folklore. It was something that all, my, all these unbelievable players participated in, and it was bigger than themselves. And if you were part of that organization, you felt it. I'm not, it was a, it was a tangible feeling when you walked into the locker room. It was like, oh my gosh, this is like revered ground. And you just thought about the people that had gone before you and how big this thing was. And then you had George Steinbrenner, the personality bigger than life, who was the owner. And you just said there was a certain way that you carried yourself. It was the Yankee way. I'm not kidding you. Like we had to button up our buttons to the top. We had to blouse our pants to a certain level. We had to have we had to shave every single day. Like there was a, a this is the way that we carry ourselves. It's about perfection. It's about being the best. It's about carrying ourselves in a certain way. So you kind of got enfolded into this overarching story that was bigger than life. And you had the privilege of being a part of it. So in a similar way, I want you to think with me about the Christian story. And all the characters that have gone before us. And all the different things that have been laid out for us. And it's much bigger than that. Right? We talked about that. that what does that lead to? I don't think that leads to life to the fullest but about the kingdom of God and being a part of that great adventure, the about participating in life with the other, the idea of going into the gap of someone's pain and ministering there, bringing peace, standing up for justice, doing the right things. All of that stuff is the story that we get to the privilege of participating within. So um, N.T. Wright does this phenomenal job and he makes it very simple, so I hope that I can just do a real quick review, but I hope that it is very meaningful to you 
And N.T. Wright simply calls it um, the five-act play. And he just, so he's breaking down all of scripture into five acts. And the very first one is creation. So we have the creation, um, and then we have the fall, then we have Israel, then we have Jesus, and then we have the church. So I'm just going to go through each of those and just spend a couple of minutes on them. So this first thing in creation, it's establishing the storyline, right? In Genesis 1.1, it simply says, in the beginning, God, he created the heavens and the earth. Two very, very powerful statements, right? In that very first verse of the scripture. First of all, God as creator, the all powerful one, the one that has the grand vision, the one who is in authority, the one who is taking care of everything. We talk about having an intelligent designer. If you talk, I'm not into all the different, you know, science and all that stuff and how to, how it all works together, but I know that they said if it just tilted off the axis just a degree, we'd burn up, you know, or all these different things had to be absolutely perfect. And the creator, God, understood how to do that. And then he puts us, and he says, there's a relationship between heaven and earth. And sometimes we get lost, we think heaven is this place way out there. And I think what God is trying to say is, no, heaven and earth, kind of like N.T. Wright's thing, is overlapping and interlocking. That we catch glimpses of heaven here on earth. And actually, if you think about the Lord's Prayer, it's our job to how do we bring heaven to earth. Think Mother Teresa. She brought heaven to earth all the time. And then carrying on in verses 27 to 28. This is, if you want to take a picture of this one, this one is a one worth uh, reflecting on all week long. It says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and he said to them, be fruitful and increase in number Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Right from the very beginning, God created man and woman in his image. So that means we are image bearers of God. That's his plan, right? In the garden, this perfect creation that he called good. He's trying to set the thing and say, you know what? I've made you in my image for a reason. I want you to live according to my ways. And then this idea that's vitally important is it says that God blessed them. This is critical to our understanding of as image bearers, what are we supposed to do? And I think it's something that we lose sight of because we get away from the basics. See, God is a blessing giver, and as his image bearers, we are to be blessing givers as well. And I just want you to hold on to that theme. Have you ever really thought of yourself as a blessing giver? Like, that's the reason why I'm here. People ask me all the time, what's my purpose? And if I say to be a blessing giver, it, it seems like it's trivial, but it's not. I'm telling you, like the Mother Teresa thing, that literally just came, that was not in my notes, that came to me this morning. It's a great thing to think about because... It was just each day I woke up as an image bearer and I did the thing in front of me. And then God used it to make a huge difference. And all of us can do that if we choose it. Now with that lesson though, it comes a responsibility. So in, the, in those verses, it says, be fruitful and increase in number. So Adam's like, I got this one, right? That was a good one. You're not following it. You're not following it. <laughs> Sign me up. Adam's all in. I can do that one, God, right? This whole heaven and earth thing. I got it. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. So then it says, fill the earth and subdue it. That word subdue is about ruling over or establishing God's rule. So what I want you to think about is establishing the kingdom. I never put this together before, but in the very first chapter of the Bible, God's establishing this idea of kingdom. And we're going to talk about that a lot. So he's establishing this idea of God's reign or rule. Okay? So with that, we go into Genesis 2.15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. 
God gave Adam a job to do, or you can look at it as a mission to fulfill. This was part of his kingdom responsibility. He also, God sets up right off the bat, in his creation there will be boundaries. Things that will lead to life if followed, and things that will lead to death if disobeyed. So he introduces this idea of free choice into this relationship. Okay, so let me just do a quick synopsis about the takeaways of creation. God is creator and established his way. Just like we talked about how the Yankees had the Yankee way, God's establishing his way. God gave us relationship with him and one another. He gave us blessings, he gave us responsibility, and he gave us free choice. The Garden of Eden is the perfect picture of community and life in God. So this was God's perfect plan, that which he called good. And it's simply this, for his image-bearing people to populate the land and rule over it by being blessing givers. You get that. That's huge for the rest of the story. Because that's what was established in creation. This is what God put forth to say, this is what I want for all the days to come. And yet... We know what happens next. So here comes the fall. Okay? So in the garden, in the garden, in God's good creation, evil was present. I always found that to be interesting. So the serpent was part of God's good creation. But man's free will unleashed evil. Prior, it was simply present. I think that's fascinating. So evil is present. And yet it wasn't actuated until man, in his free choice, unleashed it. I think there's some truth for that today. So Genesis 3, 6 says, When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. I'm not going to go deep into this, but when we get to Jesus, we understand that Jesus is a redeeming God. He's trying to take that which was good... Here came the fall, right? And it took all of it away. It gave evil the upper hand. And then through Israel and then to Jesus, it's all trying to restore it. It's all trying to redeem it back. So if you look at these three things in that simple verse, in verse 6, it talks about the, the theme of there's three kinds of evil. The lust, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Okay, You're going to see that play out through all of Scripture. And so if you think, if you know um, the scripture, you know that when Jesus came, he was also brought to the wilderness to be tempted. And he was tempted with three temptations that were these three things. So we say these were how the first Adam was tempted with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And then Jesus was called the second Adam because he was tempted in the three same ways and yet he overcame each of them. He's trying to restore creation by doing that. All right, so here's the result. And this is the idea of God upholding his boundaries. He does what he says he will do in Genesis 3, 22 and 23. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. So God's original plan for good creation has now fallen due to man's rebellion and sin through disobedience. So the rest of the Old Testament is the story of God and Israel and trying to form a nation to redeem it back to that good creation. So in Genesis 12, 1 and 4, the Lord had said to Abram, go from your country. That's very important, this idea of going. Go from your country. Go from your people. Go from your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. And I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. This is the, co the first covenant that God makes to establish a new people. The nation of Israel. And he's using them as the chosen one to bring back and usher in this new kingdom. This new way of living. So he says to Abram, go. And this is that risky part. 
Because think about it in your own life. If I asked you to pick up where you're at right now, with how comfortable you are with the routines of life, where you work, where you sleep, the things that you do, the friends that you have, and the way of life that you go on with, if I said, I need you to go and bring you over to this place, I need you to go into the unknown, I need you to step out of your comfort zone, how many of us would sign up and do it? And this idea of Abram had to wrestle with that, but he does it, and he leaves his comfort zone so that God can now use him to be a blessing to the rest of the world. So God gives him a promise. I'll make you a great nation, and I will bless you. But it's Abram's responsibility. A promise comes with a responsibility. And he says that you will now be a blessing to others. And I think that's still true today. Abram chooses to, expect, to accept God's promise because he went. And then the whole rest of the Old Testament is this struggle with God and his people. So we talk about the exile and return. We talk about the coming and going. They talk about uh, going into the, the promised land and then getting kicked out and then going to Babylon and getting taken over. This whole rest of the Old Testament is a story of coming and going with God. And that leads us to Christ because that didn't work. So in Christ, we have a new kingdom. All right? And we're not going to go deep into this, but this idea of kingdom is pivotal to understanding. So I encourage you to study Jesus as much as you possibly can because it's his ways that we're trying to glean from. So he shows us how to be truly human, to be made in the image of God, to live according to the Father's ways, and to establish a new kingdom as we defeat evil. Now, it leads us to the church. After Jesus dies and is resurrected, brought to the, to the throne of God, he leaves behind his people, the ones that say, I want to follow you, the disciples. And it's the church's responsibility or mission if we choose to accept it, to bring about this new kingdom. Let me check the time here. Okay, I'm not going to go into this today. Um, I want to bring going up. What I want you to understand, though, is that Jesus is trying to establish a new kingdom. That's his goal. And it's a new way of doing things. So maybe four quick things is his reign, right? God has established a new, a new way of doing it and has given authority to his followers. He has a new value system built on justice, grace, love, peace, and the other. He's given us his two great commandments of loving God and loving our neighbor. And he gives us his prayer, the Lord's Prayer, about how to bring the kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then he gives us his plan, which is be part of the reconciliation and the restoration so that we can bring in new creation. The story starts in creation. It, the fall happens. Yes, the story of Israel and all the people and the given and taken, God trying to use in their obedience and disobedience leads us to Christ who establishes a new kingdom and then we have the church who are supposed to be part of ushering in the new creation. Okay? So with that, I'm going to bring up Dawn and she's going to talk about what it means to go. I talk louder than Sarah. Am I going to blast anybody up? Um, so I'm Dawn Pratt. If I haven't met you yet, um, I live in Dighton. I have four kids, and I'm a stay-at-home mom. And I get to talk to you this morning about this idea of go, the go command uh, from the Great Commission. If you look on Google, if you Google comfort zone, you'll come up with all these images, right? And I have one of them to show you. Um, and there's this saying, and it's kind of trendy now, like, life begins outside your comfort zone, right? You could say that to anybody, and they would get what you were talking about. So your comfort zone is here, and if you look on Google, there's a, like a little circle drawn, like here's your comfort zone. And then out here is where life and adventure happens. And that sounds great, you know, like for some people. You can show the next slide. Because this is what comes to your mind, right? Like, these are the people for whom life outside the comfort zone works, right? Like the, the thrill seekers, you know, the adventurers, the ones that 
take risks and all, you know, like the adrenaline rush, all that stuff, right? This is my son actually jumping off a bridge uh, down the Cape. <laughs> and you can show the next slide. This is what Go looks like for me. <laughs> I am pretty much a fan of spectating and um, <coughs> watching while other people do things and kind of steps and, you know, tiptoeing my way into something. And I want to tell you a story about what I've tiptoed into. Um, I, let's see, it began a few years ago on a girls' weekend. Gotta love the girls' weekends, I just have to say. And I was with a friend of mine, we were having breakfast, and she was telling me about her horrible job. And she was describing how she had gone from a position that she really enjoyed, which got dissolved, and she was in the one school, in the one school system, teaching the one grade that she did not want to teach. And she was describing kind of all of these sort of unbelievable events that were happening in her life, and she's a veteran teacher, she's taught for years, and she was beside herself, like panicking in October. And I remember honestly thinking like, waiting for her to finish so that I could say what I was gonna say, and suddenly I started to listen, and she said something like, like 90% of these kids are on free lunch, which means, their families live below the poverty line. And I thought, she's making that up. That can't be, I live in Dighton, you know, and this is just not something that I hear about too much. And so I looked it up online, and she was wrong. It was 96%. So virtually every student in this school lives below the poverty level. That flabbergasted me in this day and age. And this is a school in Pawtucket, and I was between jobs at the time and kind of like, you know, I can only do so much laundry and all that stuff. And I said to her, well, do you want some help? Like, I could come in. And so it started with one person, one hour a week. And I went in, and you know how when you start to give something, you really get, right? And I did not expect that in any way. I'm not really a big kid person. Um, so it wasn't like that was the draw for me. But I just started going every week and noticing things. Noticing peeling paint. Uh, noticing teachers screaming. Like you could hear it in the hallways. Um, noticing the level of students that uh, had a hard time learning English, uh, different, all different things. And I started having conversations uh, with my friend who's a teacher, and she said, you know, let me introduce you to the principal. So I met the principal and started saying, you know, I, I go to a church with people who care and want to make a difference, and is there anything that you think we could do here? And she said, how about some paint? And I should have told you to go. I don't know what's there. Okay, so we started painting. <laughs> and painting and painting and painting. And that was how we built, started building a relationship of trust with the administrators of the school and the teachers. You can go to the next slide. That's David LeDuc. He's been my right hand painter for eons now. We've painted. Virtually, not every surface in that school, it's a big school, but we painted a lot. So volunteers came, we did that for a long time, and then we thought, well, what else could we do? And so we gathered things and brought them into teachers. And so you can go to the next slide. And we brought in these goodie bags, I Love Teachers, and it had school supplies in it and whatever. And what we found the day that we brought those in is that the teachers who had walked through the cafeteria and the hallways and the places we had painted got inspired and some of them painted their own rooms. And so it started kind of spreading that way. You know, like they felt like, oh, you know, like somebody cares. And they would say that to me in the hallway. And then that led to a cleanup day. You can go to the next slide. You might recognize some kids there. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the cleanup day, you know, brought a whole bunch of different people in. Some of you are nodding your heads. You remember that day. And you can go to the next slide. A new sign. That sign is brand new. It used to be falling down and everything. And somebody said, you know what? We'd like to replace that for you. 
And somebody else who was there um, works for Hasbro. He went back to his company and started talking about the school. And they came and did their own cleanup day and landscaped and put art in the you know playgrounds and things like that. And then we just started talking about it and more volunteers came. Go to the next slide. This is Richard. This is one of my favorite pictures. Richard comes in once a week and he works with special ed kids in first grade. And I walk through the cafeteria and he's sitting there and he's doing flashcards while they're eating their snack or whatever. And he makes a difference in their lives. So he is one of 12 volunteers and from one person once a week for one hour. There are now 12 of us who, in, in addition to all of the events that we've done, we've put in, we've donated over a thousand hours to this school. And I forget what the next slide is. We did a field day. You can go to the next one. We have a different events that, you know, the teachers will say, hey, do you think you could do this? And then we go, I don't know, let's see. And I talk to some people and we try to put something together. And uh, we are going to be doing a field day again this year, and I'm going to be able to talk to you more about Baldwin School in a bit um, over the course of this series. And you'll be invited to participate. And one of the kids on that field day, he came up to me, his teacher brought him over, and he came up to me you know, with that little gap tooth grin, and he said to me, this was the best day of my life. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just field day. But to them, it's huge. And we're gonna be working with some of the Highlander students to do field day there. And I wanna get back to the Hasbro thing. This picture is just art in the hallway um, there. But it speaks to me about what this has become um, in just a few years time. So the guy from Hasbro, after they came and did the cleanup day, they thought, you know what? We're right down the street, we wanna do something. And they brought toys for Christmas. They've done this two years now. And for every student in this school, there are 750 students in this school. So at Christmas time, they all got toys from Hasbro. But not just this school. Every school in the Pawtucket school system, Hasbro brought toys to for two years now. And that's not something that is even related to me. And yet, the ripple effect, you know, like that's how it goes. And for me, it was... The experience was kind of like, have you ever crossed a river and there's like stones you have to step on and some of them are slippery and some of them are wobbly and you don't know until you get on it, right? And, and you're kind of doing this and, what, and, you know, and you're looking around like where is your next step going to be? It wasn't like there was this grand plan. It wasn't like I started out saying, oh yeah, you know, I'm going to march in there. It was, it was less like you know, walking a high wire, doing some feet or storming a castle, or you know, picking a lock. It was more like slipping in the back door. And there were a lot of times where I felt inadequate. Uh, I still do. I have people who will say to me, oh, you're a teacher. No, I'm not. Oh, you're an educator, you're an administrator. No. Um, oh, you're a parent of one of the students here. No. There are so many reasons for me not to be there, and yet, it's one of the reasons I get up in the morning. It's exciting to me. And we're starting to weigh, you know, like what would be the long-term value of these efforts? I don't know yet, but I know it's changed me. And so I just want to say there, there's no cookie cutter for go. Um, it's so easy to disqualify ourselves from it. You know, we hear stories and think, oh, wow, that's great for you. You know, I'm nobody special. We're all in this together, and each of us have this command, this go command. It's legitimate for all of us, but what does it look like? And I'm a big fan of baby steps. I'm a big fan of, like, testing things, you know, trying it. Let's try and see. And sometimes that is all it takes, is to tell yourself, I'm going to try it. Because go looks like any step that you take outside of that comfort zone. That's for another person. It's just seeing the person in front of you and having patience for them. It's holding the door. It's giving the compliment. It's picking up the tab. It's simple things. Inviting the new kid to sit at your lunch table. Mustering the courage to say hello. Taking the time to get to know someone 
Initiating the conversation, even if you have to practice it at home first. Staying for coffee, even when you want to go home. Those are all things that everybody, we all face it every day. It's an everyday risk. Will we take it? When is the last time you did something for the first time? That's the question I'd like you to think about um, this week. When is the last time you did something for the first time? And it can be little, it can be the smallest things. Um, what I love about God is that's the stuff he uses. He knows who we are. He knows, you know, we're not, most of us are not amazing, you know, and that kind of thing. But one of the things that I also love about this command is tying it in with the idea that we're sent. Um, the scripture from the Great Commission it also says that God is with us. Surely I am with you even to the end of the age. So when we go, we don't do this alone. We don't go out on our own. We don't come up with this grand plan and ask God to stamp it with his approval. Um, you know, I don't need to decipher the secret code you know, to figure this out. All I have to do is kind of take that little step and see. And God is, is present with us. And I think that's a beautiful thing. So when we go, we obey the command by giving ourselves to everyday risks, asking God to help us notice, and relying on the one who is sending us. Wow. 